way more difficult. Much like what we talked about in Bible study today, you cannot have a more direct question that was given to our Lord today in the passage that we have. And I want us to begin our reading in Luke chapter 10 in verse number 25, okay? And I think it would be right almost like we did Easter. I just, we won't do this every week, but I think we should do this in lieu of what we talked about Easter. And I'll show you why in just a minute. If you wouldn't mind standing one last time as we read this holy scripture and this most important question here. Luke chapter 10, verse number 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord God, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your what? Mind. Mind. We're going to ask you to engage your mind today. And think about what the Lord is saying here in that passage with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. That part we hear quite a bit about in this day and age preached. Verse 28. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you shall live. But he, the lawyer now, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down to Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was coming down the road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, you love this in verse 33 he had compassion and he went and he went to to him and bound up his wounds pouring on oil and wine and then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him verse 35 and the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying take care of him Whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think, Jesus now speaking, to, the to be a neighbor, proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, you go and do likewise. Our Father, we're thankful for the reading of the word of God this morning. The richness of of this story and this account. Lord, I know that it's called parable by many of the uh, different translations, but the Lord doesn't call it a parable. You didn't say it. And Lord, we are in our hearts believing this incident happened and that we are to come to a better understanding of knowing who the Good Samaritan was and that we also might truly have that heart that this man had and that this individual reached out beyond compassion and made sure, even after he was gone, that the first person who was so dearly hurt would still be taken care of. Lord, we see that as a picture ultimately of who you are in providing our salvation and helping us to answer the question what shall we do to inherit eternal life? And we give you the praise, and we give you the honor, and we give you the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Now, in this passage, and the wonder of it is just so amazing in the sense that what you and I have is a possibility to get a gleaning from what it means to be a good Samaritan. But before we get to that, I've got to ask you this question. When he, the lawyer, gave it to Jesus Christ and asked, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The lawyer, being an expert on the Old Testament law, where was he getting that from in the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible? Last week, we had Easter. 
Last week, I preached on where was the resurrection in the Old Testament, and we showed five different examples that were Old Testament references that showed that, yes, there is a resurrection, that our Messiah will come back, and he will take care of us, which, by the way, is what the Good Samaritan is saying to the innkeeper when I return. Did y'all catch that? What a beautiful, beautiful picture of how important it is for us to see that. Is it possible that eternal life isn't in the Old Testament? Now, I'm going to tell you that if you take the word eternal and you do a word search through the literally 34 books of the Old Testament, you will only find it mentioned in reference to your soul one time. One time. That's it. And it's found in a rather, rather unique passage here. I want you guys just to see this so that you can guys kind of get a, a taste of it in this passage here, being in Deuteronomy 33, verse 27. And this is it. You can find that there is eternity, but when it says that we can be a part of that, this is is it Deuteronomy 33 verse 27 the eternal God is your dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms and he thrust out the enemy before you and said destroy now get this Moses is giving the second law which is Deuteronomy there's only going to be one more chapter chapter 34 the final instructions before Israel crosses over Jordan into Beulah land or the promised land and that's when they're going to inherit this Jesus knows that when the lawyer is asking the question what must I do to inherit eternal life it is difficult it's not something that can be there now I will say that the word eternal is in Isaiah 60 but it's talking about the eternal covenant that God makes with his people and it's not necessarily meaning all peoples but here in Deuteronomy it is expressing like the resurrection of Jesus Christ a belief into it that we will be in the arms of God by faith the everlasting arms y'all remember that him Garrett yeah I interrupt uh Take care of back in surgery. Okay, thank you, sir. Right now. All right, she's back in surgery. Yeah, that's good. Amen. No, sir, thank you for letting us know. Yeah. So, this passage here brings it about that there is a relationship with God in bringing out eternal life for the individual. You've got to know that when the lawyer made that commitment, the lawyer said to him, and stood up. He, he, we stood up as we read the passage. He stood up amongst the crowd and said, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He was bringing out a challenge. And the Bible says he was testing him. So we know this to be true. That in and of the process, there is a personalness to this. And that's what's really missing in the Old Testament. And the lawyer probably wanted to see what Jesus would do in that process, okay? Now, the Deuteronomy 6 passage is going to bear out his answer. But right now, I just want you to think for a minute. How was Jesus going to deal with this individual knowing that really eternity and life as far as what we know as heaven isn't something that's fleshed out in the Old Testament? But guys, they're really beloved. I want y'all to see this because this is hard for me to say. Neither is the concept of hell strongly in the Old Testament. It's not there. It is the New Testament fulfilling the Old Testament. Much like the second law of Deuteronomy fulfills Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, it is the New Testament that fleshes out the Old whether it be the resurrection, whether it be heaven, whether it be hell, that's what we need to see here, that when the man is asking the question, 
He is asking it with only one arm used. The rest of it is tied down. Now, the New Testament fully brings it out. Matthew 25 talks about a final judgment and that the sheep and the goats, the ones on the right are the sheep, they will go into eternal bliss. The, left, the ones on the left will be the goats, and the goats will go into eternal damnation. They are cursed in eternal fire is what Matthew 25 says. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have numerous references on eternal life, and it's encouraged. But listen, this is the best part. You don't get this. You don't get the message. It is John who writes in John chapter 20 that you would believe he mentions eternal life. Now get this over 20 times, six times in chapter six alone in just a few verses. He mentions how that this Lord Jesus Christ has come from the father and he's come to offer eternal life to us. Eternal life means that God is giving us and our souls a following of never, ever, 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 ever ceasing to exist. Those in hell will wish that they could cease to exist. But those of us who will have life, we will have a continuation of that life, and it will continue, and it will continue, and it will continue. And that's why the writer of a Amazing Grace said, though 10,000 years would come, we will still be singing his praises because time will be no more. That, beloved, is eternal life. So, here's the question. In that understanding that it was not complete in the Old Testament, why does Jesus answer the young lawyer the way he does? i got to confess to you. I've had people come up to me and ask, what does it take to be saved? Which is what Acts chapter 16, verse 30 talks about when the rich, when the um, uh, Philippian jailer says, what must I do to be saved? I would, had somebody that come up to me and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I would not have answered the way Jesus answered. You know the law, the lawyer. And a lawyer, by the way, was a person who, much like our judges today, would translate and interpret the law of the old Moses' law, the Old Testament. So, why did Jesus answer it the way that he did? And I want you guys just to look at this because when he does this, he says in a wonderful statement that what is written in the law, how do you read it? Do you see how personal all this is? Jesus Christ is a personal Savior. He died for each and every one of us, and it is personally we go to him. It is personal in our evangelism. It is personal in our life with him. He loves us and makes it that personal. And that's what he says to the lawyer, how do you? interpret this. I love that. Even though it's a challenge. Jesus said to the apostles at one time in, in John chapter 6 when they, he was talking about eternal life and that you've got to take me into your soul. He saw many of them leave and said they did not believe and he looks over at the 12 and he says will you go away also? And Peter who often would have foot in the mouth disease would say at that point in time the right thing lord where are we going to go you have the words of eternal life how beautiful is that how amazing how again personal is that you have the words of eternal life so the lawyer was to interpret and he answers correctly with a passage that comes out of deuteronomy and it says here in verse 6 hear o israel Verse 4, this is the one point where it says it's mentioned one other time, but this is the key one in Deuteronomy. He, the Lord God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Now, I asked this august body here of Capstone Baptist Church, what's missing? I'm comparing to the Luke chapter, Luke chapter 10, what's missing? That's right. 
The brain is missing. Now, I want you to look at your Bibles and look at the Luke 10 passage, though, and I want you to note this. It does say four times, with all, with all, with all. How important that is, with all. It is so key. It is everything with all, just like it says three times in the Deuteronomy passage. The lawyer is quoting that, and then he adds what is important here to love your neighbor as yourself. The Deuteronomy passage doesn't have that. It's not that tied in. We know this as the great commandment. Love the Lord God with all your might, all your soul, all your, all your, all your soul, all your, let me just read it here, all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. And then he says, and love your neighbor as yourself. And that's where we see in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, you shall not take vengeance and bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That's the answer that the lawyer gives. And that's what Jesus says back to him and says, you have answered correctly. So we can leave here today knowing that we love God with all our soul, all our might, all our mind, and we can go out of here and everything is just hunky-dory. Love our neighbor ourselves, and you're on your way to heaven. Is that what Jesus just did? Is that right? You know what? Not only is eternal life a difficult concept for the Old Testament Jew to grasp, salvation was difficult for them because this is how they saw salvation. This great commandment of loving God with everything they had and loving your neighbor as yourself was what got you into heaven. So why would Jesus do this? When we know, every single one of us in here in this room would say, well, you must really have faith in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, and you must repent of your sin. And once you do that, you can be born again. Jesus didn't do that. Now, I'm going to suggest to you a reason. And I could be wrong. I didn't get this out of a book. I didn't get this from some other pastor. Just my own little chicken scratching being put down on, from pen to paper. And here's what I think it possibly was. It is in part and parcel because of the question itself. Notice the question here. And this is the answer, by the way, and, and he answers it correctly, and Jesus says that. But here's what I thought was questionable here. He says this, you do this and you will live. If you do that, you live. I think the question was posed wrong. And I think that the problem is, is that when you look at the question, he is saying to them, Lord, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, here's what I found out in going back to the original languages. The word, as much as we talk about eternal being difficult to find in the Old Testament, as much as we find resurrection, like we said last week, not being fleshed out in the Old Testament, it's referenced. We find also, get this, now you're going to love this, especially if you've got a little property. The word inherit is really not in the Old Testament. It's not there. It is a different word. It's translated in many of the translations, inherit or inheritance. It is translated differently, and it means to take possession. The Old Testament definition of inheritance means to take possession. And it's related to Israel going into the promised land and God said, you didn't inherit the promised land. He said, you got to take possession of the promised land. What does that mean? That means they had to go in and fight for what was theirs. They had to go in and do the dirty work of eliminating the people who were their enemies. And that's what they had to do. For inheritance is a totally Greek term. It is a Western term that was not in the Hebrews vocabulary. Oh, they talked about heirs, and the heir in the Levitical law got a double portion. But they never talked about getting an inheritance. Over in this country and in the Western countries, we all talk about leaving an inheritance. What that means isn't that they take possessions. 
What it means is you simply receive the possessions. You're gifted it. And we call it an inheritance tax, don't we? It's just something that we get. Because of birth or because of a will, it is something that is left for us. God, in the Jewish mindset, didn't leave the promised land for them. He said, you got to go take the promised land. Didn't he? Yeah. Isn't that what Moses told Joshua? Yeah. said, if you don't do it, and you don't do it right, you're going to suffer for it. And so, when the lawyer is asking the question, he's asking it, not from a Jewish perspective, but he's asking it from a Greek perspective because they have adopted some of the, so much of the Greek and Roman culture of inheritance. Jesus is not thinking that that's a valid question. If he just said, how do I get the promised land? Then you go in and work for it. But he said eternal life. And Jesus gave him a scenario that is impossible. You cannot love the Lord your God with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength perfectly. It cannot be done. And furthermore, you cannot love your neighbor as yourself. We are too sin-laden, and we have too many problems, and we tend to always grab hold of our flesh before we think of anyone else's flesh. You cannot do it perfectly. There are times you can, just like there are times that I purposely asked Deb to pray for worship this morning as we sang, and I believe that we honored God, but I think what we do so many times is not honor God because our spirit is not right. We are not perfect. And there are times it could be because of the, of the attitude that we come in with. It could be because the music was not set right. It could be a lot of different things. But what I'm saying to you is, because of our sinful nature, we cannot take possession of anything, and we surely can't take possession of eternal life. And that's the problem. The lawyer is using what would be something that's to be given to him when the Old Testament is something that you were to go after and get. That, I know, is exactly what is the difference. It is the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. And they cannot mix. The Old Covenant has to be fulfilled by the New Covenant. In other words, the Old Testament is not complete. It is not, it is partial. It is an understanding of God's law. It is an understanding of God's way. But it is not the fulfillment of God's ways. So the lawyer's question, even though it's very personal, and Jesus' response is very personal on how he received it, what he thought of it, it's not real. It's not a, what, what, I hate to say it, but we all heard these teachers say this, and I've said it before, there is no wrong questions. Yes, there is. And this one was a wrong question. He's using a different dichotomy to understand eternal life. And it cannot be done. Moses' law, basically Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, was not fleshing out the concept of eternal life, let alone heaven itself. When they died, you know what fleshed out for them? I want y'all to pay attention to this. Fleshed out for them was the grave. You couldn't even put paradise into that category. The only time that we could really reference this was what we talked about as far as Isaiah, as far as the psalmist saying that we would see God again. David, when his child died, born of an illegitimate relationship with Bathsheba, said that I, after the child died, the child is not coming back to life, but I will go to the child. And people use that as a reference to say that's where children go to heaven. And that could be, and I believe possibly correct, but it also could be it just meant he's going to go to the grave. Because that's what they understood. Sheol is the term for the grave. So in this process... You have a difficulty in seeing the, this mindset of heart, soul, strength, and mind. Get this, and so that you can see this in a more clear way, I put this up on the screen. I want you guys to note this. You shall love the Lord, Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, 
with all your mind. It is impossible. Now listen to me. What's Jesus doing? I'll tell you what he's doing. If I'm driving, let's say that my son was spent the week out in, in Big Ben. I really wanted to be with him. I couldn't do it this week. Well, let's say I get out there and I don't use my GPS. And I'm just going to kind of point and sh shoot and aim. Ready, shoot, and aim. That's usually how I go, right? And I get way off. And the next thing you know, I'm over in Montana or I'm over in some place still looking for Big Ben, right? What happened? is I missed perfection of the Big Bend National Park there in West Texas. And that's what is going on with the Jewish mind. You're lost and you don't know it. How many people are out here around us in our community and they think they are saved and that they know that they're on the way to heaven when they're going to Montana and they thought they were going to be in somewhere in West Texas. Am I the one that's ever done that before? I can tell you. I was driving from Amarillo, the Panhandle, to Austin. Thought I knew the way. I traveled it numerous times. And I'm headed closer to Fort Worth than I was to Austin. Hmm. That's a true story. Took me about an hour and a half to try and fi finally figure it out. Map? I don't need no stinking map. I know where I'm going. The world believes they're going to heaven when they think they're good people, when they think that they're trying hard. They'll contribute to Samaritan's purse, not knowing the understanding of what the good Samaritan was all about, and then how he's a picture of Jesus Christ who binds us and wounds us and takes care of us. Then he leaves us, and then he says to us, I'm coming back for you, and I will pay the debt in full. Glory. If that don't give you chills, I don't know nothing else will. That is what our Savior does. That is his perfection being imputed into our unrighteousness. He pays the price. You pay nothing. And somehow most of the world thinks, well, I'm doing pretty good. You know, I ain't killed anybody. I, I got my problems. I'll admit that. But I'm just kind of hanging in there. That's really what the lawyer was saying. But I want you to notice what James says about this. James says that for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become what? Accountable for it all. This world out here has not repented of sin the way that they've been called to repent. And as a result, they think they're doing right. Can you have perfect devotion to God and loving him completely? No. Can you have perfect humility and loving him in the right spirit? No. Can you always be satisfied in God and loving him in a satisfaction way? No. Can you, or do you always trust him perfectly? No. Do you believe that God is in charge of everything? No, we don't. That perfect love that the Old Testament is saying with all, with all, with all, with all, needs for us to resonate with us, to know that our people that are around us, they think they are scoring points when God, when they're eternally lost, and instead of going to Austin, they're going to Fort Worth. I can't get more blunt than that. My love for God falls so short, and my goodness of what I think I have as goodness is nothing but abject failure. Isaiah calls it filthy rags. I might look good on the outside. I, I thought I cleaned up pretty good. I love my shirt here. It's I, I've got little zippers that I use and I've got little things in my zippers. And I just, I think it's very stylish. I come up here trying to impress y'all. I got my new shoes on. I have creases in my pants where I had taken it so that it just, they're just not crazy looking cargo pants. I got creases in there. I am stretch. I got nice, nice, wonderful, wonderful shoes that just are, and this, this shirt's just kicking, okay? Could have probably trimmed the beard a little bit and haircut, but that's okay. Y'all won't let me go on that. Y'all think the pastor's doing pretty good. Yet, I could be the most worst wretched worm that ever lived 
standing behind a pulpit, doing nothing but spewing out, blaspheming to God because I'm living an unholy life. And no one would ever know, would you? God knows. God sees the hearts. And we don't want to think about all the things that we try to do to measure up, but his goodness is the only thing that will get us to heaven, not our righteousness. That is the bottom line. And that's the reason why we would all go to hell if we had to depend upon anything that we do. Nothing matters. The law was only a road sign. It was a map. And it was to show us and the Jews, Israel, how lost we truly are. That's what needs to be said. I want you to see what Paul writes to the Romans. Owe no one anything in Romans 13 except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Notice what he says here. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Jesus is taking this and making the Old Testament complete and saying that our attitude to others is the key to our Christianity. But he's also showing us we're not very good at it. Anybody get upset with anybody on the road today, this week? I, I'm the only one? I'll tell you something. I had some 20-something on my rear end for about three miles. And they were so close. And I was tapping my brake. I wanted to slam the brake down and just let them hit. They were right. They came across and went beside me and started riding alongside me. A lady was doing this, or at least a woman, I should say. Do you think I had great thoughts of loving my neighbor? No! I wanted to get out of that car and wring her neck and tell her to get off that phone. I was going the speed limit. She's, and it's right up on my rear end. And she saw me tapping the brake, and she was, a, I wondered if she had to go. Mm. You know? Right in on Baghdad Road. And I got home and I was so tense and I was so mad. And I wanted to say women drivers, but I've seen men just as bad. And I wasn't loving my neighbor at all. I hate to tell you that. Am I the only one? I deserve hell. That's not retribution. What I had going through my mind was far beyond that, trust me. The bottom line is I think my righteousness makes God think I'm okay when really I'm nothing but a hell-bound sinner. Galatians 3.10 says it this way. says, you offend in one point of the law, you're cursed. It means you're damned. Galatians 3.10. I deserve nothing but hell. And it's not just because I got mad at somebody on the road. Verse 11 in Galatians 3 says, no one is justified. So we've got to be lost before we can be saved. That is a key point for each and every one of us when we speak to family, we speak to loved ones, we speak to friends, our neighbors. we got to make sure they're lost and they need to see the map. Because otherwise they're offending a holy God. And that's where we all fall short. I, I cannot stress this enough. I tell you, two men went to the temple and prayed. I tell you, the man that went down to his house justified rather than the other was the humble servant, the humble tax collector. But the one who was religious, the one who was respected in society, did not go. He did not go justified because all he thought was his goodness i know i'm amongst christian people i know that you know this and i want to remind you if you're a believer in jesus christ to witness to people this way and show them how the law 
determines they cannot be justified, that they're lost. But then also check your salvation and make sure that you have not offended a holy God by thinking you're saved when truth be known, you're damned. God wants us all to know that it is through the perfection of Jesus Christ, who is a picture, get this, of the Good Samaritan. That's what this is really about, is he is the one who's going to love the neighbors in the right kind of way. And we'll speak about that next week. Have you, in your life, determined that you have not, and how do I put this in the right kind of way, that you have been acquitted of your sins by taking on the perfect one and him saving your soul. I hope you have, and I hope that you are not of the spirit of the mindset of the Pharisee in Luke 18 who thought he was all that in a bag of chips. I pray we might be like the tax collector who simply says, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And what did he do? He crushed his chest. He crushed his chest because he knew he had failed God. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Each and every one of us need to realize that we can be a better witness if we'll witness like Jesus does. Understanding that the Old Testament is what drives us to make us realize that we are sinners and we must need the perfect one, the Messiah, to save us. Our good Samaritan. Our Father, I pray that we would simply confess to you that you are the one who we were attacked by the forces of Satan, but you were the one who came and removed the evil out of our souls. You bound us, you healed us, you put us into a place where we could be nurtured and brought back to health. And then, Lord, you told us, you said you would come back for us. And receive us unto yourself and that you would pay any other debt that we incur along the way Lord I pray that we might see just how secure we are in our salvation that Lord not only are we imperfect but Lord may we understand that we're going to sin tomorrow we're going to sin later on we're going to sin and it yet is still going to be covered by the Samaritan who loves us so much. Lord, as we look into this next week, may you grasp it in our hearts. And may you take it and place it in us. And Lord, may we go out and be the Christians that we should be, the little Jesuses, the little Christ that we should be in caring for others. Lord, may we not condemn. May we not hurt them. May we not pass on the other side. But Lord, may we simply love them. And we give you the praise. And we give you the honor in Jesus' name.